she filed um, her marriage license under her new married name, Jennifer Affleck, but she was planning to change her name to Jennifer Affleck back in 2003 as well. And it would have been weird then, too. I don't like it. (laughs) No J-Lo. No Uh, J-F. See? (laughs) Listen to me talking. I sound like a monster. Welcome to Keep It, Cricket Media's show about pop culture and politics and what happens when they smack into each other at an alarming speed. I'm your host, Ira Madison III, a television writer and Fallout Boy fan. I'm Louis Fertel. I'm a TV writer and Jane Fonda historian. Let's get into it. And we are back with an all new episode of Keep It. I'm Ira Madison III. I'm Louis Fertel, and it's so pleasant in LA. We're doing summer exactly right. The temperature is great. God, I hope it's just as pleasant in all other places all over the world. (laughs) (laughs) You were such a bitch, Louis. Honestly, that was very mean. (laughs) (laughs) We'll just start this off with some rancor at our guest host. Um, Yeah, I am Bolly Babalola, and I am melting right now in London. It's unseasonably hot. It's like 45 degrees Celsius. It's like Dubai. Um, England does not know what to do with itself. Like everyone is bright red, <laughs> but they're still outside though. English people are very dedicated to the burning. I don't know why. I will say that every time I've been there, it has been weirdly unseasonably warm. Not this hot, yeah, um, this is- but it's people have always been dedicated to, they're like, they're in the park, they're out. <laughs> They got to get the heat. They love being outside, even if they're... And also, it's just funny because English people are complainers. So they'll be saying, oh, it's so hot. It's disgusting. But they will still be outside. I just want to say, by the way, that British people are good at complaining, period, though. So I'm really enjoying this. I feel like there's just a layer (laughs) of, like, sardonic remove to everything they do. So it's just... It feels appropriate to me that they have something collective to complain about. Complain about. No, I think it's actually going to bring us together as a nation. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Bolu, I am so excited to have you back on the show. This time you're guest hosting with us. We're so excited to get your thoughts on everything uh, that's going on in the world of pop culture. But also, you have a new book out. I do have a new book out, Honey and Spice. Yeah. Yeah. You are, you're writing all the books. This is two books, and I haven't even finished my <laughs> first one. So uh, <laughs> tell us about Honey and Spice. So Honey and Spice, yeah, it came out last week. It's a collegiate rom- rom-com. It's an ACS, it's an African Caribbean society, which is like a black student union in a un- fictional university in southern, southern England. And my main character, Kiki Banjo, has a radio show where she gives romantic advice to the female populace of Blackwell, where she basically warns them off of waste men, which is basically like British slang, black British slang for like an F-boy. Mm-hmm. And then, of course... An F-boy does arrive to the university, Mm. tall, handsome, chaotically, just chaotically beautiful. She notices that all there's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of like John Tucker must die fights going on. Like, okay, this is, there's a lot going on. And I thought I warned you guys. (laughs) I thought I, I thought I taught you guys better than this. She confronts him. Um, and she also gives a, a PSA on the radio show to warn them against this, this waste man of Whitewell, which she dubs him as, and he's not too pleased about that. And they confront each other, and there's a clash, and through a series of convoluted circumstances that I obviously made up, um, they are forced uh, to be in a fake relationship to salvage both their reputations in the university. Um, but it's also just a love story about community as well, and, and Kiki opening up, he has a guards up, learning to be part of the community, making more friends, all of that stuff. It's a love story on many levels. Thank you for phrasing this in terms of Jesse Metcalf cinema so that we can understand <laughs> that. You know, you know, that is one of my the, specialist topics. <laughs> that is why Bolu is on the show with us today. She's giving author and also... Um, Jesse Metcalf historian. Rep- yes. yeah. Yeah. How does also, this yeah. relate to Desperate Housewives season one? Go. Yes. Oh my gosh. So, uh, I mean, I could actually do a deep dive on that. But anyway. Oh, you I'm right. happy for you. <laughs> yeah. Do you know... Do you know who directed um, John Tucker Must Die, Lewis? Oh, God. Lenny Reifenstahl? No, who was it? <laughs> no, it's um, Betty Thomas. Get out! How interesting. Yeah. Also, you know, from Tracy Ullman show, she directed. Oh my gosh, um, wow. She directed the film um, Twenty Eight Days. 
Sandra Bullock drying out in rehab. She that did wild. Uh, the Brady Bunch movie. Which is, as we've discussed several times in the show, the, you know, I the simply the greatest movie. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on the British, the new like British iteration of Tracy Ullman show. I was a writer's assistant on that show. So in a way, I directed Jesse Metcalf and John Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, I don't know if I brought this up before. I went to a junket once for uh, Into the Woods because Tracy Ullman's in that, right? Yeah. Yes. And uh, I, I, this sounds like something I would just generically say about any celebrity, or whatever. She is the nicest celebrity I have She's ever met. So sweet. She's so. She so fucking sweet. rules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Yeah. She like I think ended the interview with a hug or something. It was very yeah, uncharacteristically gets, yeah. rude. Yeah. She loves hugs and she smells good all the time. I love a celebrity that smells good all the time. Nicer than Drew Barrymore, would you say? Oh, living emoji, Drew Barrymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, you can see the tears are that size. Like they belong in a text. Oh. I Actually, love her. One of my favorite things that happened this week was just the internet collectively deciding they wanted to defend. Drew Barrymore. I know. What's so funny is that I saw the defense, but I didn't see anyone saying anything bad about her. So it was underneath her post, not her post. Someone posted, uh, I wish I, you know, could like enjoy anything as much as Drew Barrymore enjoys the rain. And yeah. then each response to it was someone being like, well, you can enjoy the rain <laughs> like this if you have generational wealth or if you're a celebrity. <laughs> oh and it's God. like, the rain, the rain is free, bitch. <laughs> wow. we, should, we should say we're talking about a video where that Drew Barrymore posted herself where she is rhapsodic that it is raining. And you can picture the that. kind of glee, the uh, Chloe Fineman-esque glee that she, uh, she uh, conveys to the world. But anyway, it's so a, a caricature of what you think Drew Barrymore is, and then yeah. she actually is that. Is that. The internet is such a dark place. How can you twist Drew Barrymore's happiness to something so bitter? It's like, poor people can enjoy the rain, too. Let me tell you, the, the, the climate change is for everybody. <laughs> climate change is for all. It does not discriminate. Uh, all right, so we are excited to have... Um, romance expert oh. uh, that's what i'm dubbing you now here pressure. because we need to talk about celebrity rebranding this week with <laughs> um benefer 2.0 oh they are God. married living 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 i adore and it i i'm so happy i'm so happy that my leo icon so we'll get into that uh also I wanted to bring up this topic, and I'm glad to have you here this week for it. But uh, so Anne Hathaway recently covered Interview Magazine, and truly everyone on the internet was breathless about these photos and mm -hmm. so excited for Anne Hathaway in general. And it crossed my mind that this truly would not have happened like 10 years ago. No. Oh, the opposite. We would have been like, how dare she put all these photos in <laughs> front of us? We're sick of it. Stop trying so hard. <laughs> I can't uh, remember why people didn't like her. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna get into that as well. We will be right back with more Keep It. Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez married in Las Vegas over the weekend, 20 years after they were first engaged, and truly everyone I know was shocked that she filed um her marriage license under her new married name, Jennifer Affleck. But if you'd seen the special. 20 years ago in 2003, um, the Dateline special uh, where she was cooking at home, um, you would have heard her say that she was planning to change her name to Jennifer Affleck back in 2003 as well. And it would have been weird then too. I don't like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no J-Lo. No uh, J-F. See, <laughs> listen to me talking. I sound like a monster. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about J-Lo and Ben in general, Bolo? Oh, I adore it. I adore it. J-Lo is a lover girl. She's an unashamed lover girl. She loves fully, boldly, unashamedly. And I really, really admire it. And I actually kind of, I think second chance love is what we call it in the, in the romance world. Like that's the trope, second chance, when like two lovers reunite again after years of being apart. And I think I like it because it takes a lot of courage and a lot of faith and I think that's at the core of love um and also I just feel like it takes a lot of like we're evolved now we're grown sometimes you have to grow apart to come back together again and I th I like that it gives space for that you know sometimes you need to like go away and work on yourself before you can actually come into a relationship 
ready for it. So I'm I'm a huge fan of it. I mean, she's glowing. The pictures she posted weren't even like good quality, but you can see the happiness. She was like, I don't even care about the quality of these pics, but you're gonna see me beaming. I love that. I am a fan. That said, there's something treacherous about the era of around 2003. Just we don't exhume much from that time period. Like if I suddenly threatened to marry Dance Dance Revolution right now, you should be worried. You know what I mean? Like what's what's wrong with Lewis that this is reentering his life? So I am excited just because also like they're now both true showbiz veterans, you know? So it feels like there's a different kind of shared experience and a, and a different yeah. shared level of of A-list fame that they've had for a long time too, where it's like, well, do you expect her not to marry somebody like that now at this time? You know, so like, why not somebody she's, you know, tried a couple of times and, you know, can confirm is still hot. Mm -hmm. I'm going right. to object to 2003 not being a time um, that we don't want to revisit. Because let me tell you, 2003 was one, the debut of the OC. Okay. It was um, the debut of newlyweds Nick and Jessica. Okay, sure. Don't need to see that again. Moving on. <laughs> Summer movies. Freaky Friday. Charlie's Angels 2 Full Throttle. We Chad had... Makamari was the, the boy. Okay. Top model debuted. From Justin to Kelly dropped that summer. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, the I AFI can't, can't shut up about From Justin to Kelly. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't believe I've actually seen that film. There's no reason for me, a little girl in London, to have seen that, to see that film. I, I actually have a question. Wait, yeah. What was American Idol to you? Like, that's the thing. I didn't really watch it because they didn't really show it. But I watched right. just from Justin to Kelly for some reason. I think I knew of it from afar, but I just didn't watch it. But... Um, which reminds me, did you then watch World Idol where they put Kelly Clarkson what? on and she, she had to compete against all these other nations and she lost? No. No. Yeah. Very underdescribed uh, moment in pop culture history. We did so much oh weird shit God. to Kelly Clarkson before she, you know, broke away famously. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that um, the Lizzie McGuire movie and Dangerously in Love from Beyonce also dropped in 2003. So. No. To, okay. Dangerously in Love, that is a specific 2003 high point. Almost everything else you said was a sad or middling reboot. So that's what I'm talking about. Fall Out Boys debut album. I hate that fucking era. I hate their <laughs> I hate what they're talking about. I hate, I hate men in those jeans. I hate spangly belts. Next. <laughs> It's so funny because I was I am rewatching season three of One Tree Hill, which is around that era, and they're talking about podcasting. They're like, mm. "Yeah, you, this is podcasting. This thing is kind of like a radio show. We can download like, download it onto your iPods, and it's just so cute and so quaint." Fall Out Boy appear. They're like doing a little gig at the like you know the town cafe. It's all very sweet. Feel things just pop culture just felt a bit purer then, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's very, the, you know, like Gilmore Girls, like that time. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, now you can't get away from podcasting. But I would say I've yet to see podcasting like really sort of done well on a show. Well, it's, like, it's, it's a hard Except for, medium me, to me, make compelling. You know, it's like in, in yeah. the, there weren't many TV shows about rape making a radio drama, you know? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. Frasier. <laughs> that's true but that was the opening segment and they moved right along yeah. <laughs> recording a podcast now is um like only murders in the building which i love uh oh, and selena yeah. gomez like is so much better in season two yeah uh, they give her more to do this time uh but they're like running around with their audio equipment and i'm like i know that podcast is awful to listen to <laughs> <laughs> The sound quality sucks on that yeah. podcast. I'm just yeah. going to guess. I, I can't picture Martin Short, yeah, like doing the levels before they start no. recording or whatever. <laughs> um, but going back to J-Lo, I actually am very excited for her, too. You know, I feel like I feel like she and Ben are the right level of toxic for each other. <laughs> no, that there's hot. a suspense to this for me. That you know, hot. it's like, where could this possibly go? It's like a little, it's mostly good, but a little bit bad. And I like mm -hmm. that. I like that. I think that's why they attract attracted to each other, though. They're the, like you said, it's the right kind of mess. They get each other. And also they're grown. Like, actually, it's kind of refreshing to see two celebrities who are around the same age find each other. That happens very rarely. You're like, okay, you've been through the same shit. You're both grown-ups. You've got kids. You know, you've been through some stuff. 
so what I liked about JLo's like um, newsletter, she was like, you know, we're bringing our kids together as like a blended family. I'm like, you know what? Good for you guys. Good for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think of other celebrities who've married the same person twice. Oh, well, you got your Elizabeth Taylor, of course, and uh, with Richard Burton, but they remarried somewhat after they had separated. So there's not like a grand, you know, generation long gap between their Family marriages. Mm -hmm. Um, separated from his wife and then got back together with her. And that's Emily Blunt's sister, famously. Yeah, no, that's that's his second wife. Mm. Mm. You know, well, a marriage I've brought up that I'm very uh, that I'm a fan of is Anthony Edwards and Mayor Winningham. And Anthony Edwards and Mayor Winningham were in a movie in the '80s and called Miracle Mile that no one remembers. That that does have some fans, but they met again doing the DVD commentary for it some years back, and now they're married. So that's pretty cute. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, Natalie Wood, I'm sure she regrets getting remarried to Robert Wagner. Well, we can't really ask her, can we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Her sister her sister was on Keep It. I think That's her true. sister would agree that she regrets it. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, yeah, it's in the book that she made a mistake, I think. Yeah. Also, I am, I am sorry, side note. I, it is very weird to reference the fact that Natalie Wood's sister was on this podcast talking about her sister's death. It was among the weirder times in my life. I'm surprised I was there for it. Yes. <laughs> and former Bond girl, Lana Wood. Yes. Also, I, I have a question. Have we gotten Ben Affleck movies recently? Oh, no, we did. The Tender Bar. What else has he done recently? Oh, The Last Duel, right? Hold on. Yeah. Uh, as the resident Ben Affleck stan. Um, <laughs> yes, please tell us. Well, the last movie we got that he was in was Deep Water. And I don't like to talk about that, though. No, I, I mean, I don't like shallow water. Why am I even going to go to that? <laughs> uh, Adrian Lynn lost his mind uh, while directing this film. And it is, I don't think you should be able to disrespect Patricia Highsmith like that. <laughs> no, there should be a, a gay screening room where we tell you if this is actually going to go wide. You know, you have to meet the Carol Bar, otherwise it doesn't go out. <laughs> uh, um, and then of course you have uh, Anna de Armas in that film and mm -hmm. it is actually it's so ex interesting to me like him going back to J-Lo but like right after this like very public Anna de Armas situation very, very strange relationship where they walked around like zombies as well like you never really saw them happy together either like Sean and Camila yeah, yeah. That was the exactly. most zombified relationship. That yet. was yes. so weird. Mm -hmm. He looked like he was held on the hostage. On like it was, it, it was distressing to see. Yeah, and so like I'm very happy for him as well because I would actually say that um, Ben Affleck has always sort of been one of my um, celebrities that I tend to like a bit more. Like it, at least on film, it's interesting that he was sort of like. He was like movie star, you know? Mm. And when you think about people who are movie stars now and like sort of like command a box office, you know, you really, we really sort of have like Tom Cruise left, you know? And it's like, you wonder sort of what happened with Ben Affleck, but I'm like, it was his relationship with J-Lo that happened that sort of destroyed him as a sort of A-list celebrity because g Lee and shit happened. Uh, yeah. But I think he's back to it. I feel like over the years, he's gained a sort of like f fandom. And, and I, and I want to say it's because there's like a resting angst about Ben Affleck where you just want to tell him it's okay or something. I, yeah. I want someone to explain that thing to he me looks, that Ben Affleck has. Little, yeah, he looks a bit tortured, you know, like there's some yeah. inner turmoil going on, you know, and you want to be, you want to be like, it's okay, babe. It's okay. Everything is going to be okay. I can I actually know. picture J-Lo saying it just like that, too. Yeah, so I feel I like you've actually okay. <laughs> deciphered something. You know, what's, you know what I was um, shocked by? Like, looking at Ben Affleck's uh, filmography. You know what show I completely fucking forgot about uh, that he was a creator of? Project Greenlight? Push, Push Nevada. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that very short-lived show. That was, was, was it a um, – what happened on that show again? It was a federal agent went to a small town in search of like a missing $1 million, very sort of like Twin Peaks ish. Start Derek Cecil um, and um, Charlotte Horvat. But um, it was sort of like the audience was watching 
this is a very weird time in America, Boa. Uh, the <laughs> audience was watching the show and like you could sort of like solve the mystery right. too. I was going to say it reminded me of The Mole really? or something. Yeah. When was yeah. this? What year was this in? Like 2002. Oh my gosh, sounds like a very early interactive show. Yeah. That's so interesting. And then, of course, he was in the Jenny from the Block video. And then, you know, we were I mean, on the fence about when, him for a while. That's, that's when I took notice of him, personally. <laughs> <laughs> and then pivoted to director and then um, was Batman. So, Batman. Right. The grumbliest Batman. The, the Charlie Browniest Batman. What do you think? Do you think he and George Clooney are one still friends? And two, do you think they talk about their time as Batman? Mm, good question. Well, Batman is both the case of like the iconic character you want to play, and also I just don't believe an interesting character at all. So at all. I, you know, I, he again, he's sad. Something bad happened to his family, and he seems to be into detective work. That's all there is to it. Michael Keaton's the only one who's given me like an interesting Bruce mm. Wayne. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, and maybe the Lego Batman. I don't know. You couldn't pay me to watch that. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of rebrands, um, I do want to briefly talk about Miss Anne Hathaway because she covered Interview Magazine and everyone was breathless. And I truly want to pinpoint the period when Anne Hathaway was cool again. Well, I want to say about her, is this renaissance more to do with there are lots of lovely photos of her where we don't hear her speaking and the people who hated her once upon a time did not like the tidbits that came out of her mouth because she sounded quote unquote to theater kid so she is was it- literally like a list leah michelle yeah R- wow it's rarely been said like that and now i'm jarred <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is i think there was a time we were very cynical so like that kind of earnest energy that she she radiates was kind of cloying to some people. I mean, I'm a huge Princess Diaries fan, a fan of the books. So I was very, you know, I was very kind of, as I was like 13, 14, I was ready to judge her. I, I'm not going to lie, when she came in Princess Diaries and I loved her and she had this kind of earnest charm that worked for that kind of character. But I think that in that kind of age, it's very easy, like, like that cynical, like the cynicism kind of made that, energy that like theater kid energy very jarring and cloying and corny and disingenuous and I think now we've kind of pivoted to the other side because we've gone through so much darkness you know what you're like this is really really refreshing like uh, just a woman who loves what she does she loves her husband she likes pretty dresses and she thinks what she does is very cool what's wrong with that you know I would also offer that James Franco helped oh yeah because hosting the Oscars opposite James Franco earned her a lot of sympathy. Well, I, I don't know about... I, I feel like people dismiss that Oscars out of hand entirely and blame the both of them, not realizing he did most of the worst work on that uh, telecast, whereas she seemed pretty game for it. I think also the thing with Anne Hathaway was, in her initial roles, you just brought up Princess Diaries and Devil Wears Prada, she played like a relatable person, and then suddenly she was in every movie, so she was like supposed to be relatable to everyone, Everyone, and I think it was easy to get sick of that quickly, matched with the fact that she was suddenly had this ascendant Oscar moment, where it it just felt like like Mm. every light in the universe was pointing towards Anne Hathaway. Lady Miss was the height of like people disliking her. Right. No, I think this is it can be summed up by the first line of her Oscar speech. People rolling their eyes when she said it came true. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know that whole thing of oh that's too cloying, it's too it is disingenuous, yeah. etc. And she herself did interviews later saying like people got sick of me, I had to disappear for a second. But at the same time, I just want to tell people like get into cloying people. I'm sorry like yeah. like they've mm. got something we all need. So, exactly. you know, I'm not saying it's always like like yeah. we, we all cringe at things sometimes, but cringe is also good sometimes. Cringe is yeah. good. She did, she did disappear. She did the hustle. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, she had that you weird know, couple of years where she did like song one and those kind of weird little movies. Uh, I yeah. will say from that period, the intern is still an iconic classic. I was gonna I was actually gonna talk about the intern, yeah. Yeah, more more people need to recognize how great the intern is. Actually, she was also in uh, Love and Other Dro- Drugs with um, Jake Gyllenhaal, which was actually quite good. It was kind of like a darker. I like that film a lot. Actually, yeah, I, I really uh, liked like, it. It's one of like his sexier films, actually. 
I love that film. And then she was in a not so good adaptation called One Day, where she yes. played a Brit, like she did a Yorkshire accent, which is very hard to do even as a British person. But then as an American, it was just really bad. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. It wasn't a great accent. Yeah. Song One and One Day fill the same spot in my head of, oh, remember when Anne Hathaway did that? Because m- m- all of her other moments are these very high profile, you know, she she doesn't have like a long list of weird indies under her belt, for no. example. No, I would just sort of say like, Colossal. That was like among the riskier choices she made. And I think it's a semi successful movie, but it really doesn't fit in with the here comes the giant Anne Hathaway movie we're all expecting vibe we now have with her. Yeah. And of course, her um, best um, indie flick is The Witches. So <laughs> well, now, when she dared uh, to step into Angelica Houston's shoes, it got a little testy. <laughs> those shoes are twisted and no, nobody's feet fit in them. <laughs> <laughs> and we are back uh, with our favorite segment of the episode. It is Keep It, Bolu, as yeah. our special guest. Why don't you go first? Lay it on us. Love Island. Oh, Love I, knew Island. It. Okay. I knew it. <laughs> Definitely. It's, I've never, wa- I mean, I'm not a huge fan of straight men anyway, right. but something about mm-hmm. this show has my hatred is at an all-time high now they're like gaslighting but also fundamentally it's like very mean in a very mundane way just just saying one thing to and i know we know it exists you know men lie all the time but seeing it in like kind of this lab rat kind of situation (laughs) a very concentrated situation you're like oh you guys are very gross and you see how they it's kind of like a pack mentality you see how they just do things to impress other men whilst dismissing the woman's feelings so yeah love island has made me make me hate um men more basically basically it's just it's just a, just like a salad of f boys just different flavors of f boys but the thing is like it's so weird because there's a like you know there's a 50 grand prize and it's not a normal situation you know you're not exposed to like books or tv or, or you're not even allowed to like write or anything you just have to talk to each other. So you see these girls forcing these relationships with these guys because, like, what else are they going to do? There's literally nothing else to do. And also there's a chance to win money. So it's just all these politics that kind of, like, make it very sick and twisted. I recognize that I am a part of the problem. But, yeah, <laughs> I think it's – I just feel like it's a very – it's a very strange show that I cannot stop watching. I love Love Island. And I also <laughs> never mind, like – following your tweets because like the <laughs> I, I don't mind the spoilers so it's because when it airs in the US it's always like a few weeks behind. Uh but it's it's really just sort of about watching nothing unfold and yet everything. everything. If you love watching human beings, it's a very fascinating it's TV been, like, show. The other day some guy who was coupled up with another girl, there's this thing called Casamor where they can meet other people. Casa Amor, is, Amor is, is iconic. It's is iconic. iconic. And she, he did stuff with the girl. And we had to watch this guy admit to his girlfriend that he licked someone's tip. She's told the guys that I, like, sucked her tits or whatever. Come on. I licked her tit or whatever. And I was like, this is absurd. Like, we're just watching this guy <laughs> talk about sucking <laughs> another girl's tit on TV. And the girl and his girlfriend's like, what? like this is humiliating well it feels also just like big brother a show we talked about last week uh, which by the way the uk tends to do way better than we do it over here um uh in that they do these that's extremely fed because there's so many episodes and you have to watch all of them to keep up and the drama's constantly unfolding and here big brother's on three times a week so it literally becomes Uh, like an entire hemisphere of your brain like you have to keep thinking about it UK people, in, like, in comparison to Americans, are just a lot less glossy, I think. They're just more gritty. They're just more, like, ugh, I don't know. I don't want to say ghetto, but, like, they're just much more... Um, they're more rough around the edges, and I think they're more willing to be exposed. The mask falls up very quickly. I will say, we have a sheen to ours, like, with, like, the Love yeah. Island US. Like they're, like, they're very hot, the people on Love Island US, but I will say that something's missing once you hear someone, like, with like an Alabama accent. 
<laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, you're not that hot anymore. I need the British accent in my Love Island. Really? Right? Oh, I find the British accent so like annoying after a while. <laughs> and I am British. I have one, you know. <laughs> Lewis, what is your keep it this week? Okay, my keep it, first of all, is just to the entire idea of this movie, The Gray Man. What is it? It costs $1 billion, and it stars three of the hugest stars ever, and nobody seems to care about it, and it's just going to be on Netflix, and that's that. It's uh, Chris Evans, it's Ryan Gosling, and it's Ana de Armas, and there's just premiere photos of them promoting this movie, and... I guess they went to H&M and decided we're, we're just going to buy the outfits here and then we're going to walk right out of the carpet. It is a, it's such a bizarre pop cultural moment where clearly they're e- – maybe I just don't understand Netflix. They're either throwing this movie away or they're thinking we've spent so much money on this. We're, we're going to do it lemonade style and just kind of put it out without much word and then it will become the biggest movie of all time. Like is that the, the model now? Like is that how things are done anyway? All three of them seem very confused to be in this movie, and they also (laughs) seem to not agree that it exists either. So I don't know what to do with this movie. I don't know if it's going to be good. What is a gray man? It hasn't been explained to me. It's a color I love wearing, uh, (laughs) and that's that. You know, the Duke from Bridgerton's in it. Which one? Reggae. Reggae, yeah. And let me tell you something. Um... The, all I've seen for the press tour is people constantly. My keep it, my side keep it to that Lewis would be people constantly harassing Reggae about coming Poor back reggae. to Bridgerton. <laughs> coming back to Bridgerton, it's like, girl, he's, like, he's I'm done. Not back. God. <laughs> it's so funny well, because it actually, literally, because I read the books when I was younger, there's no role for him in the rest of the se- like. There is nothing for him to do. Like, leave this guy alone. Okay, and Shonda is not good at freestyling these days. Okay, <laughs> so. He, he would come back to the show and he would literally be popping into scenes to what? Like, you throw one sex scene in and then he's just in the background having tea. He's like, just watching. <laughs> <laughs> Let this man be a star. I read an interview where they talked about how there's potential to recast his role or something. I was like, guys, we need to just let go. Like, do you understand how TV is? Stop it. The reason people want his role back is because of him. They want to look at him, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, so you know what? Go, go look at his other work okay like there's plenty of other things that he's doing sure like look at the gray man you know what yes (laughs) there there are two seasons of for the people oh yeah that's true you can go back and watch okay the show was cute did you see this show you sound unsure no it was an abc um legal show it was a shonda flop but which does um, exist. Off the map exists. Yeah, yeah. So um, he, he was good in it. I don't know. Ira, what is your keep it this week? Uh, my keep it goes to the U.S. government. But why? I know, there's many, re- I know there's many reasons. But specifically, <laughs> I want to talk about the rollout of this monkeypox vaccine. Oh, oh my God, you're right. It's treacherous. <laughs> I want to talk about... Okay, first of all, monkeypox is back. <laughs> you're, you're thinking it went away or what? Well, I mean, like, I feel like few people remember, like, when monkeypox popped up before, but it was very much contained, um, like, years ago when it popped up, and then it went away. Now it's being spread, you know, through skin-to-skin contact, and, you know, like, it can be, like, sexually transmitted, and... One, I want to point out that, like, it's being passed, you know, right now, mostly through our community, Lewis. Um, you know, a terrorist. The black uh, community. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, one, it's being, it, it's giving me flashbacks to, um, the AIDS crisis, and only that the rollout is being bungled. Um, it's really being framed in the media as sort of like this thing that like gays just like are dealing with. But I'm like, first of all, we're trying to do our due diligence of like getting the fucking vaccine, you know? Unlike with COVID, where you had to sort of be like, um, hey, you know, do you want to get this vaccine, Americans, you know, so you don't kill other people and also maybe die yourself? Like, when it comes to, like, vaccines, like, the LGBTQ community, like, they jump on it, 
you know, because they don't want another crisis like that right. um, to happen to us. But it doesn't help if sites are crashing, uh, if, um, you know, people can't make appointments. Uh, I was lucky to get one of the um, earlier vaccines when I was back in New York, um, but they set up like a vaccine center in Los Angeles that is like so far east in Los Angeles that like you're going to see Moses um, and, and like <laughs> wandering through the desert before you even get to that center. You take it's that like, exit. Yeah. I, I cannot understand how after COVID we still have this problem. Like, like what is going on? I got emails, uh, two emails the same weekend about having been exposed at various gay parties to uh, monkeypox. And then I went to the recommended place where you're supposed to get the shot. And I did get the shot. I got there early. And so it, it was like, largely problem free. But the people there did not understand that the the amount of people who are quote unquote exposed at these like parties, they're like huge. So they then weren't prepared for how many people came in, which was intense. It suddenly within like 15 minutes turned into fucking Dallas buyers club. People are like exchanging <laughs> glances. doors are in and out. People don't know where they belong. People are upset in tears. They're like, they're turning into Karens like <laughs> that, that kind of like, no, but I was here first. No, but I had an appointment, all this stuff. It was like utterly confusing. And obviously it's a new situation. You can be sympathetic to the fact yeah. that people don't know exactly what to do. But man, it is incredibly stressful not knowing, having to rely on text chains to be like, okay, you can go here at this time maybe to get this. You know, it's like a lot of unsure. It's a lot of, but you have to leave work and you have to get there early and you have to do, and it just feels very, um, mm -hmm. like there's no, the way Los Angeles has no urban planning, it feels like that. There's just disorganization. <laughs> And I don't know the proper pathway to get to where I'm going. Now I have to take three highways. Uh, and the care, listen, the care did jump out in some people I saw a lot. I mean, like, listen, you give, you give a white gay man an inch. Uh, they, they will <laughs> complain about something, you know? And that's also why I'm mad at the government for, you know, just not being better at this rollout, too. Because if it's going to be word of mouth, like, the community spreading the word of mouth of, like, where to get them, you know, like, white gay men are going to be texting each other and their friends, you know? So, like, what then happens to gay people of color? Where are they going to find out about these shots, you know? And how are we going to get this info to them? And I'm just, I'm just, you know, mostly just mad to it, like, the, like, conservatives and ugly people who don't have sex online um, <laughs> framing it as a mostly gay problem, too, because I'm like, bisexual people exist, um, you know, like, there's, heterosexual men who have sex with other men uh and it's also not just a sexually transmitted disease like it is skin to skin contact mm -hmm. sex is one way to get it but i'm like you could get this from like the subway from clubs and stuff so i'm like maybe don't knock people who are trying to get the vaccine early before it starts spreading to um kieran and um Breelin, okay mm -hmm. on the playground because then once <laughs> that happens <laughs> <laughs> Once that happens, you'll be really mad. Right. No, the amorphousness of the messaging is very confusing and very um, disempowering. Anyway, I'm mad as hell. <laughs> <laughs> as he should be. Peter Finch, uh, 1976 best actor. Right here. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Bolo. Hello. Thank you so much for being here this week. Oh, my gosh. My complete pleasure. Like, literal icon. I miss you so much. Yeah, I know. Uh, me too. We also still have not had a proper, like, hang. I know. I know. But when you come to London, we must. Yeah. I feel like, we, yeah. I feel like a, a Keep It London show is in our future, and then you can guest like host that, be. too. I feel yeah. like it should be. We need, yeah, we need to get that together, and you will obviously be uh, right there on that stage with us. Maybe we'll even get Camila to come out. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I know. I was so. I was actually so disappointed that the one time that you were like here in LA, I was in like Amsterdam. I know. This all is spring. A, this is a problem. My jet setting. Yeah, you know, we we keep it's missing each other. That's 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 the rom com trope we're living in. I the, know. The, the, the like... <laughs> I, I know. You two are going the distance. Two thousand two. Um, well, of course, listen, you were on the podcast before uh, to discuss Love and Color, which is also available. Read the mm -hmm. book Love and Color if you have not, and also go and get Honey and Spice 
which is out now wherever you get your books. Thank you. And officially, officially a U.S. bestseller too. Okay. Fuck yes. I yeah. <laughs> That's so fucking exciting. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. No, I'm really excited that it's just out there and interacting with the world now. Because I'm <laughs> writing it. So it's, it's good. I'm glad it's out there now. It was worth it. 